Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to DSPG. Today, we're excited to have Dr. Roberta Rudnick from UC Santa Barbara presenting on glacial diamectites and the evolving composition of the upper continental crust. As usual, we'll go the talk. The talk will go for about forty to fifty minutes, and we'll end with a question and discussion session where people can ask by typing into the chat or by um, <clears throat> or by uh, by raising their hand, and I'll I'll address everything in uh, as as we receive them, um, and in order as best in order as I can. Um, next week. We'll have a talk by Paul Link, and I'll send out that uh, that announcement tomorrow. It's titled titled uh, Pro, uh, Proterozoic Stratigraphic Proterozoic Stratigraphic Record of Western. Okay, that's okay. Uh, Proterozoic Stratigraphic Re Record of Western Laurentia. So that uh, definitely join in for that, and uh, I'm going to start the uh, sending to everybody at the beginning um, in the chat a short message that links you all to uh, code of, our code of conduct and just a couple of points um, to keep in mind. And um, so, so you have all of that information available and that should have gone out just now. Okay, but with that, um, uh, we're excited to hear your, your presentation, Roberta, and I'm going to let Andre go ahead and introduce you. Uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, so it's a pleasure to see people come in. Uh, we have a larger turnout this year, so hopefully it will continue. And for people who sign for first time, uh, we encourage you to register uh, for this um, seminars uh, on uh, virtual seminars of Precambrian geology and this way you will get a sort of weekly announcement about upcoming seminars. So with this it's a pleasure to introduce Roberta Rudnick. Uh, she uh, got her undergraduate and uh, master degree in the US in Oregon and Texas and then uh, she made the move uh, to Australian National University uh, to get a a PhD there with Ross Taylor. After it, she spent time as a one humbled uh, postdoc in Max Planck University uh, and uh, uh, sometime back in Australian National University until uh, he moved uh, to US and started a job in Harvard University where she moved uh, to professor in 2000. Uh, she then moved to University of Mar Maryland, uh, where she spent a um, significant part of her career until recently she moved closer to us uh, to University of California, Santa Barbara. Uh, Roberta is uh, known for her work on uh, composition and evolution of continental crust, emergence and development of continents, uh, continental mental lithosphere, um, work on eclogites and um, relatively recently, I guess in the last 10 years, uh, she moved in a new uh, direction using diamectites uh, to infer composition of upper continental crust. And that's the topic she will present today. So with this, I pass to Roberta. Okay. Well, thank you very much for the invitation and also for organizing all of these um, seminars that have been wonderful to have also the archive on, on YouTube that we can watch. So um, as Andre said, I've been sort of, uh, well, I've focused on the continental crust for most of my career and uh, starting with the lower continental crust and then gradually moving up to the upper continental crust. And um, I like to start with this picture just because it's a really cool shot. Uh, this is kind of links uh, the topic with also humans, which is that this is a shot from uh, the Kapal Craton, where we have Archean basement that has been glaciated and you can see the glacial striations. Uh, and that happened 300 million years ago during the Dwaika glaciations. And then apparently uh, that nice smooth but striated surface was a, was a irresistible canvas and Bushman came along and uh, 
and created petroglyphs on top of it. So it kind of links all much of Earth history uh, together and also the topic of this talk. I like to start uh, these talks by acknowledging all of the people who've been involved with this work. As uh, Andre said, we started this about 10 years ago, and what I'm going to present is sort of the culmination so far, but the work continues today. And in particular, there's been a lot of students and uh, postdoc uh, involved in this project. And here's the names of, of many of the collaborators. Um, the, uh, these two guys here, Will and Mike, uh, were undergraduate research assistants who did the yeoman's work of separating out the, the fine grain matrix of these glacial diamectites from the clasts and preparing the samples. Uh, Rich Gashnig is really the hero of this work because he was the postdoc who worked on, uh, he sampled, he was involved in sampling almost all of the samples and uh, some we got from collaborators. Um, and much of the work I'm gonna show today has been his work and uh, several PhD students who are pictured here and we'll see their work as we go through. And also of course, um, you know, funding uh, from both NSF and the Chinese University of Geosciences, the University of Maryland. And uh, yeah, so um, with that, there's and, and many more, and then you'll see at the end uh, some of the work that's ongoing on these samples. So we could argue um, that of all the portions of the earth, of the solid earth, we probably understand the supercontinental crust the best because we live on it and we can sample it and it's the most accessible. And so you might wonder, well, why are we revisiting or why, do, why were we interested in revisiting the composition of the upper continental crust, given that we must know it pretty well after all the years of studying it? Well, the main reason is because the continental crust um, even though it's a really small proportion of the silicate earth, it's, it's only 0.5% by mass of the silicate earth. It contains a large proportion of uh, the earth's incompatible trace elements. These are elements that preferentially will partition into a melt during mantle melting, and they get concentrated in the continental crust. And this is a plot that shows the proportion of a particular element in the crust uh, and these are just arrayed here um, in the order that of their relative incompatibility. Well, not exactly, but they're all incompatible elements. They're arrayed to give a smooth pattern. And these are just different people's estimates for the, the bulk continental crust. Um, here's, for example, the work I did with uh, Dave Fountain back in 1995. Here's the classic Taylor and McLennan 1985 composition, which is an end member actually of, of being the least enriched in these incompatible elements. And then there's a bunch of other models. Um, this does not include some of the more recent ones like the Hacker et al, which would be uh, equally enriched in these incompatible trace elements. So even though it's a small portion of the earth, it's really important in terms of concentrating these elements. And amongst these incompatible elements are highlighted here in red, thorium, uranium, and potassium, which are the heat producing elements. And so it's really important uh, to, to, in understanding Earth's energy budget to try to figure out how much of these elements are in the continental crust, because whatever's in the continental crust today is not in the mantle and available for producing heat that drives mantle convection. And so this is just a, a plot, some pie diagrams to show you uh, what proportion of heat producing elements exist in the crust. On the left are three pies um, at, that depend upon what the, you choose for a bulk earth composition. So this would be a low heat production bulk earth like Javois et al who models the bulk earth after Ansta Ticondrites. At the other end of the scale is Turcotte and Schubert have a very high heat producing earth. And shown here, and then, and then the intermediate models like McDonough and Sun in the middle, but what you can see here, the blue portion of the pie is the proportion of heat producing elements in the continental crust, depending upon which bulk earth you choose. And you can see that the continental crust constitutes probably uh, a minimum of 25% of the earth's total heat production, perhaps up to almost uh, 75%, uh, depending upon what model you choose. So it's really important uh, uh, reservoir of for these elements. And then if you look to the right here, 
uh, within the continental crust itself. And of course, this is choosing one continental crust model, but this picture doesn't change very much depending you know, which model you choose. All of them are very enriched in these uh, heat producing elements. So if you look at where uh, we think the heat producing elements are concentrated in the continental crust, what you'll see is that the upper continental crust has the majority. And we know this from heat flow studies because we can measure the heat production at the, at the top of the crust. And we know that if, if the crust had such high heat production all the way down, we'd have a much higher surface heat flow than we observe. So this is not controversial at all. Um, so, so this is the picture today. And one of the things we are interested in understanding is um, has that changed in the past? You might imagine that, for example, if continents grew over Earth history, then the proportion of heat produ producing elements in the crust would have increased over time. Uh, likewise, if you assume, if, if you can uh, say that the continental crust changed composition uh, from a more mafic to a more felsic composition, then that picture would change over time as well. So that was one of our motivating uh, factors in pursuing this, this work. So uh, here's an outline of what I wanna go through today. Um, first, I wanna talk about how does one go about getting an average composition of what is clearly extremely heterogeneous region of the earth. Um, and then a new, new in quotation idea um, with, because Gold, Goldschmidt actually uh, thought about this long ago, but he didn't really do much work in the area on this topic, uh, is using glacial diamictites to peer back through time. Um, and the two main conclusions that I'm going to show you today from the data that we've collected is that first, surprisingly to, to us, it was a big surprise. We found that the diamictites composition record the rise of atmospheric oxygen. And we also see evidence in the diamictites for a change in composition from mafic to felsic sometime between 2.9 and 2.4 billion years ago. Okay, so here's a beautiful picture of the Scottish Highlands just because it's a very nicely exposed portion of the upper continental crust. How does one go about deriving an average composition of, of uh, what we're living on? So for major element compositions, this has been done pretty much by a brute force method. And here's just a shuttle image of the of part of the Canadian shield. And back in the 70s, Canadian geologists from the Canadian Geological Survey went out and did grid sampling of this exposed shield. This is meant to be um, you know, illustrative, not, not uh, literal. Uh, but they went out um, and collected samples, uh, outcrop weighted proportion samples at grids along the Canadian Shield, and they analyzed those samples and made composite samples and analyzed those for major elements and a, and a suite of trace elements. So one of the publications resulting from that is Eden Farig, 1973. They had more than 14,000 grid samples, and um, and this is exactly where. Uh, our estimates for the upper continental cross major element composition come from. And more recent work was done in Eastern China uh, by my colleague, my former colleague who's passed away sadly, uh, Gao Shan, who uh, did a similar study from Eastern China. So that's the major elements, but major elements don't vary a huge amount within let's say igneous rocks. Silica might vary by a factor of two, whereas trace elements can vary by orders of magnitude. And so, Fundamentally, trace element compositions are much more challenging to get at. And so one of the ways that people do uh, try to get estimates of trace element compositions is to analyze the composition of fine-grained terrigenous sedimentary rocks like shales and lyrus. Uh, this is a picture of the Mancos shale in Utah, which I actually happened to see this summer because I went out to uh, the Colorado Plateau and I was, and I saw almost this exact picture, which I had taken off the internet. It was very exciting. The idea behind using shales um, to get an average composition is that they sample wide regions of the continents through weathering and erosion, and the insoluble elements get transported more or less quantitatively from the site of erosion into the into the sediments. And of course, many people have done this work over time. Uh, one of the classic studies was by my former PhD supervisor, Ross Taylor, pictured here with Scott McLennan, my academic brother. And they wrote this book, uh, still 
widely used in 1985 about the continental cross uh, and its composition and other people who've had very influential um, um, work in this area is, for example, Kent Condi in his 1993 paper. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so um, this is a plot from the Taylor and McLennan book, uh, the seawater partition coefficient versus residence time in seawater. And it basically shows you where an element falls. If it's insoluble, it's uh, in black here, and it's down here with a very short seawater residence time versus soluble elements are up here. And if we look at our heat producing elements, you can see that thorium is insoluble. So great, we can use shales, for example, to estimate the thorium concentration of the upper crust probably quite well, but thorium, uh, sorry, uranium and potassium are, are soluble. And so it becomes more difficult to try to pin down their concentrations using, uh, using trigenous sedimentary rocks. The rare earth elements I should show here are shown here, they're, they're quite insoluble elements. And so this, this method of looking at shales is a really good way to estimate rare earth element concentrations. And so here is a plot on the top of the rare earth element pattern of uh, various shale composites, post Archean Australian shale, North American shale composite, uh, European shale, Eastern China, et cetera. And you can see that they all look pretty similar. They're all light rare earth enriched, relatively fat, heavy rare earths, and slight negative europium anomalies. And the pattern for LERS is superimposed upon it. So it's not so surprising then to see that everybody's estimate for the upper continental crust looks pretty much like these shales for the rare earth elements, because that's where the data derive from. Uh, and then once you've pinned down a rare earth element like lanthanum, you can plot it, uh, you can plot the data, this is, these are data for LERS, for example, against another insoluble element like thorium. And you can derive from this correlation, if you, if you think you know the lanthanum concentration, then you can derive the thorium concentration. And so you can do this sort of, uh, this, uh, you know, cross plots for all of the insoluble elements in order to derive their concentrations, their average concentrations in the upper continental crust. And that works pretty well. Um, what one thing we need to consider, and this is something we've been working on is, but how well do we really know the rare earth element absolute concentrations. We know the patterns for sure. Uh, Taylor and McLennan took the post-Archean Australian shale pattern, uh, rare earth elements, and then they, then they knocked it down about 25% because they said, well, shales are only part, part of the sedimentary signature. We also have uh, sandstones and things like that. And so the concentration should be diluted a little bit. So um, this is just a aside. One of the things that we're working on are these data for LERS gathered by my colleague, uh, Zhao Chu Hu, who worked with Shan Gao uh, at CUG Wuhan. And uh, he's, he's produced a beautiful data set for a lot of, of elements for shales, or sorry, LERS from all over the world. And here we're showing a plot of aluminum versus lanthanum. And so we can use this sort of a plot to pin down what we think might be the lanthanum concentration, the absolute concentration if we know aluminum, which doesn't vary much. And what you'll see is that, um, you know, using this method, we get a, a, a lanthanum concentration that's about 25% higher than previous estimates. And I think that's significant. Anyway, this is work in progress. So, um, oh, and then here's the rare earth element pattern for uh, these different um, upper continental cross compositions versus the LERS from, uh, from Hu's work and the diamictite work that I'm gonna show you shortly from Gashnig. And it's re quite remarkable to me, there's, there's pretty much 100% correspondence between the LERS and the diamictites. So we're revising, um, we're in the process of revising upper continental cross composition based upon these LERS data for a number of elements. Now, turning to the glacial diamictites. So this was an idea, uh, that, you know, that Goldschmidt had many, many years ago. And it's just a very simple idea, which is that glaciers, as they move across the Earth's surface, they pulverize the rocks as they go. Um, they dump the rocks when they, when they melt uh, into these uh, moraines or become tills, tillites, if they lithified or glacial diamictites. And these deposits are less susceptible to uh, presumably weathering because it's cold climate, it's cold when this is happening, 
and also mineral sorting, which can affect um, some trace elements in shales. And if we go back to ice ages where we had glaciers over uh, much of the continents, uh, these ice sheets should sample very large areas. And so we could go and look at the fine grain matrix of the diamectites to try to estimate the composition of the upper continental crust in particular. This was our original motivation. We were interested in analyzing um, these deposits for their soluble elements that might be less impacted by weathering than a shale. And um, I'll just say that what the samples that we collected were identified pre by previous workers as being glacial in origin. And as far as I can tell, the definitive evidence for a glacial deposit, a glacial diamectite, is that you find striated clasts and you might see drop stones uh, in associated laminated sediments. This is a picture from my colleague, Jay Kaufman, from a, a, a sample from Namibia. So, so we relied on previous workers' uh, identification of these, in particular when we went to South Africa, uh, which has a lot of the, these deposits. Nick Bucas helped guide us uh, to find, um, to access um, both drill cores and also outcrops. And um, I'll use the term glacial diamectite until I interchangeably in this talk. So our project um, was to take the fine grain matrix out of these diamectites and look at them through time in order to refine the composition of the upper continental crust to determine the uncertainties on that composition because um, uncertainties is something largely ignored in the past by myself and others who have who've estimated crust composition, but we thought we could have, we have a stab at doing that with these diamectites. Uh, we wanted to see if there, we could see evidence for temporal changes of the upper continental crust through time. And we wanted to investigate what I'm going to call lesser known elements. These are elements in both the D and the P block of the periodic table that have typically not been analyzed by standard geologic, uh, geochemical methods like X-ray fluorescence or, um, or even ICPMS for the most part. Um, or spark source, which I worked on during my PhD. So things like molybdenum, antimony, tin, uh, a wide suite of calcophile elements. Uh, so we wanted to try to pin those down better than they had been in the past. And then finally, uh, importantly, we wanted to create an upper crustal reference suite. So when we sampled, we tried to sample large samples. And when we made the powders, we tried to create large amounts of powder. And we made some of these into composites. So for particular uh, formation, we might have sampled it, let's say five or six times, we would take equal weight powder from each of those different outcrops and, and put it together to make a composite so that if people are interested in analyzing, say, silica isotopes of the upper continental crust over time, you don't have to go out and analyze uh, hundreds of samples, individual samples that we collected, but you can instead focus on the 24 composites that we've generated. So as I said, there's, we, we got lots of samples. Um, this is just a list on the left here. Uh, these color coding will be used through the, the geochemical plots that I show. Uh, we do have a, a few modern, but mostly not. Mostly we focused on the Paleozoic uh, Southern Hemisphere glaciations, which uh, you can see here where we have samples. The Neoproterozoic Snowball Earth, which is of course, of course global. So we only have a very small subset of samples from that time period. Paleoproterozoic may be a similar, uh, similarly global to the Neoproterozoic, and here's where our samples come from. And then there's even some um, deposits in the Archean that have been identified. This is a picture on the right of a 2.9 billion year old um, diamectite from the Pongola supergroup and the Mozan group in uh, South Africa, and where Grant Young identified uh, striated class and drop stones. So I'll be using, as I said, I'll be using this color coding. Archean will be black, paleoproterozoic blue, neoproterozoic red, and the paleozoic data will be plotted in green. This is just a picture from the field, uh, from this Heronian, uh, what these things look like. And as I said, we're interested in this fine grain matrix. And so that's what we sampled. And so let's start with just a major element plot of silica versus aluminum. <clears throat> These are all the individual samples. Um, you can see, first of all, they're extremely heterogeneous. That's really no surprise. We do see 
definite local source regions, uh, local source compositional variations. Most of the data plot along a mixing trend between a feldspar clay component and a quartz component. So most of the samples plot along this trend, and you can see this yellow uh, triangle is average upper continental crust composition. You also see though that some samples sort of come off at a right angle uh, to that main trend. And that's due to a couple of different things. One is if there's a lot of carbonate in the sample, uh, it will dilute in this direction. And we also see banded iron formations in some of the Paleoproterozoic and Archean samples that take us off in this direction. So it's heterogeneous. And, and you might at this point think, well, it's really not gonna be very helpful if it's so heterogeneous, but what's surprising is that we actually do see some very significant changes and trends in the data over time. So as I said, the original motivation, motivation for doing this work was that we thought we could try to pin down these insoluble trace elements. Um, and so we were a little bit disappointed when we first got the first data and here's our data plotted um, for the chemical index of alteration, which is a, a really useful way of quantifying the amount of chemical weathering that a rock has seen. Um, and here's the formula over here. This is from Nesbitt and Young. Uh, it's corrected usually for carbonate and also for uh, calcium that might be an appetite. That's why there's a little asterisk there on the calcium, but it's the molar proportion of aluminum plus aluminum, calcium, sodium, and potassium. Calcium and sodium in particular are very soluble elements during chemical weathering. And so the CIA will go up with the degree of chemical weathering. And um, what you see is that very few of these diamictites have unweathered signatures. So this is the range of igneous rocks. This is actually quite generous. Most igneous rocks are probably 50, a CIA of 50 or less. So they have a chemical weathering signature. And so the whole motivation for trying to pin down insoluble uh, soluble elements kind of flew out the window uh, looking at these data. What's interesting, one of the interesting things is that the Archean samples tend to have a very high CIA and that the CIA goes down with, with uh, depositional age. Um, so we spent quite a bit of time trying to understand the origin of this chemical uh, weathering signature. And of course it could be pre-depositional uh, that the, the glaciers were scraping off, scraping off regolith as they crossed the surface of the earth. And that's what we're seeing in our samples. Regolith are, are possibly uh, pre-existing sedimentary rocks have been chemical weathered. Uh, it could be that there was uh, some amount of weathering that's going on at the time of glaciation, or they could be post-depositional. Well, if it's post-depositional, we might expect to see development of a soil profile, for example, if, if these things were deposited on, on land. Most of them are glacial marine, so they didn't have a chance to sit and weather at the Earth's surface. And when we looked at profiles across the top, to try to assess the origin of this weathering. We didn't see development of, of paleosols. Uh, we looked at lithium isotope variations with depth and I'm not gonna have time to, to show you all the evidence, but our conclusion, our conclusion is that while all of these chemical weathering, all of these um, you know, times that the chemical weathering signature could come in are, are possible and they're not mutually exclusive, we think that the signature is mainly derived from the provenance, that is, that the glaciers were scraping off of weathered regolith. Okay, so um, I'm going to show you some plots here that are, I want to introduce how to, to read these plots. So these are plots that plot um, incompatible trace elements in an order that is um, reflective of their relative incompatibility during igneous uh, processes. So lanthanum here, the lightest rare earth, would be more incompatible than cerium, more incompatible than molybdenum, praseodymium. So it's like a rare earth element plot, except we've added non-rare earth elements, and the position of them corresponds to their behavior during uh, igneous differentiation. So these plots are going to be uh, normalized, and we normalize them twice. So we first divide by composition of the upper continental crust. It doesn't matter whose we use, but we use Rudnick and Gao. So we take, we wanna compare the composition of these diamictites to at what we think the average upper continental crust composition looks like. And so we, do, so we first do that, but then because um, many of these samples may have a lot of quartz or they may have a lot of carbonate, 
And quartz, of course, has very low trace element concentrations, but what it will do, it, was, will, it, it will uh, spread out the absolute concentrations because if you have a lot of quartz, then your, your overall concentration is going to be very low. And so, um, so we double normalize, we, we normalize, to, we divide by continental crust, upper continental crust, but then we choose a, what we think is a relatively insoluble element like aluminum or yttrium. And we basically make them all come back to have the same yttrium or the same aluminum concentration to remove this, this uh, dilution effect. So here are some data for the Paleo Paleozoic samples and um, they're relative to upper continental crust. So you can see that the rare earths plot very close to what we think the upper continental crust composition is in these diamictites. But we see systematic depletions in strontium and also in molybdenum. And so what we can say is that these, um, while, while the rare earths look like, well, you know, upper continental crust, they, these samples are depleted in both of these elements. And we can quantify the, the, um, the depth of these depletions, how, how depleted they are using um, what's basically like calculating a europium anomaly, strontium over strontium star, which is just the normalized strontium concentration of our sample divided by what we think strontium would be if there was no anomaly. That's the interpolated strontium concentration, strontium star. And so it's, it's exactly like uh, one would calculate a European anomaly. So if, if there's a depletion of an element, then this, this number is going to be less than one. And conversely, if the element were enriched, the number would be above one. So one of the first things we can see is that strontium depletion is seen in all the samples. And this is a signature again of chemical weathering because strontium is a super soluble element. It's one of the first things out the gate when you start to chemically weather an igneous rock. So again, we're just seeing in, in the case of strontium, we're seeing the, the influence of chemical weathering, probably also in molybdenum. But molybdenum behavior is very interesting because it's time dependent. So um, this is a plot of these, these plots, we call them W plots because they form a W here uh, for most of the samples. And this is showing uh, an age progression from Mesoarchean, Paleoproterozoic in blue, Neoproterozoic in red, and Paleozoic in green. So here's what the one we just looked at and all of the samples are depleted in strontium and depleted in molybdenum. If we go over to the Mesoarchean, what we'll see is that most many of them are depleted in strontium, which is the chemical weathering signature, but they're not depleted in molybdenum or maybe even slightly enriched relative to our average upper continental crust. And if we go to the neoproterozoic, most of them are depleted in both strontium. We see the Ws pretty, pretty consistently. There's some that are carbonate rich, so we see the strontium being enriched in those. But then we get to the paleoproterozoic and here we get this transition. So first in the Wyoming samples, the Snowy Pass supergroup, um, we don't see any chemical weathering. So these are the only samples in the whole suite that really don't show any evidence for chemical weathering. So the glaciers here were scraping off probably just fresh igneous rock. But when we go to Huronian, we see there are depleted in strontium, but not molybdenum, and also the Makinini from South Africa. But then when we get to uh, Timeball Hill in Deutschland, we see strontium depletion, which is our chemical weathering signature. Strontium doesn't care about um, oxygen contents, but molybdenum now is becoming depleted. And so what we're seeing here is the rise of atmospheric oxygen because molybdenum weathering in an anoxic atmosphere, molybdenum is in the um, four plus state, which is insoluble. And so while we're losing strontium during this chemical weathering, we're not losing molybdenum from the continents because there was no oxygen. Once oxygen rose and the, and the glaciers were sampling material that had been oxidatively weathered, then we start to see this molybdenum depletion. And we see that systematically then after uh, from the Neo in the Neoproterozoic and the Paleozoic. So um, we were pretty excited by this because um, first of all, it justified why we wanted to look at these, you know, these elements that people don't no normally look at like molybdenum. Uh, it, we see that the rise of atmospheric oxygen and of course people had used molybdenum for, for a long time to, uh, to determine the rise of atmospheric oxygen, but mostly looking at black shales where 
the, the molybdenum that was weathered off of the continents then was concentrated. And so once you see uh, the rise of atmospheric oxygen, molybdenum concentrations of black shales go shooting up. We're looking at the complement, the regolith on the continents that has lost molybdenum once uh, the GOE occurred. So that was pretty exciting, we thought. And um, it's not just molybdenum that we see this in. Uh, we see it in other redox sensitive elements like vanadium. So now this is a plot. These are cross plots of molybdenum, molybdenum star. That's the, that tells you how depleted in molybdenum the samples are relative to the rare earths. Vanadium, vanadium star, ore, thorium, and uranium. So uranium, again, is like molybdenum. When it's in the six plus state, it's soluble. So oxidative weathering will deplete it. Um, if it's weathered without oxygen, it will not be depleted. And we think vanadium is showing the same um, behavior. And so here's all of our samples. These are the individual uh, samples now plotted on cross plots. Then the, this blue region up here is other upper continental crust that weathered in the absence of oxygen. So it's not depleted in molybdenum, not depleted in uranium or vanadium. And down here we have uh, continental crust that was weathered in the presence of oxygen, and it's been systematically depleted in these uh, elements that have um, their solubility tied to their redox state. So, um, so it's all pretty systematic. And so even though we're seeing a huge range of chemical compositions, we're seeing some local source regions, we still see these systematic changes uh, related to the rise of atmospheric oxygen. And one, uh, one formation that's worth pointing out here is the Deutschland formation. Um, this is a paleoproterozoic um, formation and uh, people have debated you know, where, uh, where it was deposited relative to the rise of atmospheric oxygen, but our samples for Deutschland are systematically depleted in these redox sensitive, redox soluble elements. And if I didn't know the age of this Deutschland formation, I would have thought it was Neoproterozoic because it has this strong chemical weathering, uh, oxidative weathering signature. Okay. Um, and then the final, the final slide on the chemical weathering is that we've, uh, one of my graduate students, Al Greeny, uh, did some molybdenum isotopic comp uh, analyses of these, of these samples with, uh, in collaboration with Ariel Anbar. And she sees, again, a very systematic change in the molybdenum isotope composition. So unweathered continental crust would plot within this bar up here uh, around zero per mil uh, delta 98 molybdenum. Where, and as you start to weather in the presence of oxygen, the delta 98 drops. And it drops because there is an isotopic fractionation between iron manganese oxides that form during oxidative weathering and water. And so the water becomes isotopically heavy and the regolith becomes isotopically light. So remember that all of these samples are chemically weathered and the Archean ones especially so in terms of their CIA values. And yet their molybdenum isotopes have not fractionated at all. So we know that they must have been chemically weathered in the absence of oxygen. And when we get to the paleoproterozoic, we see some that are at, show evidence of having their weathering signature in the absence of oxygen, but then we start to see this oxidative weathering signature coming in. And the Deutschland formation, again, is extreme in terms of very, very negative uh, delta-98 molybdenum. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I want to focus on this question of is there a change in the average composition of the upper continental crust over time? And now I'm showing you a similar plot to the W plot, except instead of the light rare earths, we're focused on the heavy rare earths and some transition uh, trace uh, elements here, vanadium, scandium, chromium, cobalt, and nickel. And so here are, these are averages now, these are not the composites, but just taking the average of each of the formations. And <clears throat> you can see that there is a systematic change when we go from Archean, which the Archean samples are very enriched in these transition metals uh, through the paleoproterozoic, which are the blue ones, into the neoproterozoic, the red, and the phanerozoic, the green. The red and the green are virtually indistinguishable from one another, but we see this systematic change of high concentrations of these transition metals uh, sort of 
middling concentrations in the Paleoproterozoic, and then low concentrations when we pass the Paleoproterozoic. Um, those of you who are uh, you have keen eyes, you'll see that there's this one sample from Western Dwyka that is plotting, it's green and it's plotting up here with the blue. Um, and that in fact is a sample. Yes, it was deposited at 300 billion years, but the glaciers were sampling ancient crust. And we know that because we have detrital zircons from this sample that are largely Archean and a little bit of Paleoproterozoic and um, neodymium model ages are or Archean. So the reason it's plotting here is because the glaciers were scraping off at 300 million years, this old uh, Archean crust that was compositionally different. So there's this overall trend of high concentrations down to low concentrations with time, but there's also some interesting variations within that. We see the systematic increase in chromium relative to its neighbors in the old samples and depletion in the younger samples. We also see very systematically change in nickel cobalt ratio, very high in the Archean, sort of flat in the Paleoproterozoic and then low in the Neoproterozoic. Now, some of these, some of these um, symmetries are due to um, chemical weathering, like vanadium, we think this is the rise of atmospheric oxygen but not, not chromium because chromium six plus is really even hard to make on today's earth. We think this is an igneous differentiation signature. And for sure the nickel cobalt ratio is reflecting the nature of the igneous rocks that these uh, diamictites were sampling because nickel and cobalt are not redox sensitive. They're both two plus and they don't change. So we're seeing a change from a much more mafic crust uh, systematically through to a much more felsic crust, both in concentrations and in these element ratios. So um, Ming Tang, who was a PhD student working with me at Maryland at the time, would sit in on our group meetings. We talk about these glacial diamictites, and he got very interested in this. And he thought, well, we can look at shales. We don't have to be confined for uh, looking at these ratios in just diamictites. And, and here's a plot of nickel cobalt ratio versus MGO for igneous rocks through time. I'm oh, sorry, um, igneous rocks in the igneous rock database. You can see how it's a really good proxy for the degree of differentiation. And he also found that chromium zinc ratio was a good proxy for differentiation. And um, you can see here that here's the difference between post-Archean sediments and Archean sediments. They're systematically different in these ratios between the Archean and the post-Archean. So he um, compiled data for shales uh, for uh, over time. And this shows you how nickel cobalt changed and chrome zinc changed. You can see they systematically change from the Archean and you get down to the end of the Archean and they're pretty much flat. Okay, <clears throat> so shales and also the diamictites. And because shales are much more geographically widely distributed than the diamictites, he looked at these um, uh, in different continents. And you could see that it's not just, for example, it's not just because we happen to be sampling in South Africa. We see this trend in all of the continents, West, uh, Western Australia, uh, North America, India, and China through time. So then he said, well, he did a, a Monte Carlo simulation taking randomly uh, sampling igneous rocks for these uh, concentrations. And the idea is that if you can pin down the nickel cobalt at a particular time, then you can figure out how much MGO concentration because magnesium concentration of the crust we cannot establish uh, by looking at these sediments because magnesium is highly soluble. And that's true for many of the major elements. So he published these data. Uh, he published this in Science in 2016. And this is just a plot of inferred MGO content using the shales over time through the late Archean. So systematically MGO decreased, and that's just reflecting in the nickel cobalt and chromium zinc ratios. And then this is just some sort of a very broad estimate of how, what this might be lithologically in the early Archean, we might see a crust then that is dominated by basalt and obviously has more commodiite than post-Archean. By the late Archean, uh, granites and TTGs dominate 
And so we see this compositional change. Um, so anyway, uh, he published this and we made a very um, simplifying uh, assumption. We thought, well, where do, where do granites come from? And granites are linked mostly to subduction. Uh, there's this famous paper with a great title. It just shows you the importance of having a good title on your paper. No water, no granites, no oceans, no continents from Campbell and Taylor way back in 1983. And so uh, thinking very simplistically, if we see an increase in the proportion of granites, maybe this represents the onset of uh, plate, widespread plate tectonics that generates granites. But you could ask, um, do these changes in the sediments reflect a less evolved crust, or is it possible that we just had more commoditeite and that this picture of, of having a lot of basalt present uh, is really inaccurate, mainly, mainly it's a, mostly blue and a little bit of orange with, with a lot more of this gray material, that, and that's why we're seeing these uh, changes in nickel, cobalt, and chromium zinc. So um, to address this question, um, Kong Chen teamed up with Ming um, and realized that one of the proxies that we could use to answer this question is copper, copper concentrations, because copper is um, incompatible during high degrees of mantle melting. So when you melt the mantle a lot, you get a commoditeite that has a high MGO and has a relatively low copper concentration. And as those uh, high MGO lavas differentiate, copper is incompatible, so its concentrations rise uh, with differentiation and you get a peak right around basaltic compositions. At that point, sulfides start to saturate in the igneous rocks. And, that, and once you have sulfide saturation, copper is a uh, strongly calcophile element. It really likes sulfides. And so as soon as you start to remove the sulfides, the copper concentrations plummet again. And so felsic rocks have very low copper concentrations. So copper could be a, um, a, a, a really useful proxy for how much basalt is in the crust, not how much, uh, it doesn't care so much about commodity, it doesn't care so much about um, granites. And so, um, and then we have to worry about, well, how soluble is copper? Well, it's sitting here, it's relatively insoluble. And so we should be able to use copper concentrations of sedimentary rocks to figure out what the, um, what the, the provenance of those sedimentary rocks is. And so Ming, I'm sorry, not Ming, um, Kong analyzed the glacial diamictites that we've been studying for their copper by isotope dilution. So very high precision, nice copper data. Here are, here's a plot of depositional age versus copper concentrations uh, normalized to aluminum because to get rid of the, the this dilution effect up and down that I talked about earlier. And you can see that the concentrations change systematically uh, with depositional age. And so here are the actual data, and here are the median and the averages as a function of depositional age. And what you can see is that the Archean samples have demonstrably high copper concentrations compared to the post-Archean samples. And so using those trends I showed you earlier of how copper changes in igneous rocks uh, as a function of differentiation, you can work out the concentration of the upper continental crust, the major element composition, comp composition and the proportion of basalt to felsic rocks to commoditeite. And so this is the, that calculation, three component mixing. And um, the conclusion is that basalt, this is just now for the Archean diamictites, the basalt must have dominated the crust that these uh, glaciers traversed because the copper concentrations are high, they demand a high proportion of basalt, not commodiite. We could add commodiite, but commodiite doesn't care about copper. And so um, based on these calculations, we can see um, that the, the, the glaciers were sampling a crust that was largely basaltic. And the best estimate um, shown down here, oops, it was, oops, sorry, the best estimate for the amount of, uh, of uh, basalt is 72% with about 10% commodiite, which is, uh, I think that came from Igor Puchtel is the best estimate for how much commodiite might've been present in the Archean crust. 
Okay, so that, that's basically the story uh, from the diamictites, but to, just to wrap it all up, um, it seems that if, if our suppositions are correct, that the um, continental crust was dominated by basalt, the, the, the emerge, and it's important here that this is emerged continental crust because we can't create terrigenous sediments without it being above sea level. Um, maybe we are looking at a change in tectonic regime from a, some, some sort of a, a, a regime looking here at the Pilbara to uh, changing across the Archean Proterozoic boundary to modern style plate tectonics uh, in this time interval between three billion and two and a half billion. Um, and maybe Earth evolved uh, obviously, we started with magma ocean. Maybe we went through a Venus-like phase, and many people have suggested this, before we got plate tectonics uh, to generate the, the Earth that we have today. So just to summarize um, what we have found so far, these glacial diamictites do provide a new avenue to explore the composition of the upper crust through time. They are extremely chemically heterogeneous. We see local source effects, but even though we see this heterogeneity, there are some very systematic changes that we see in the chemistry. And the diamictites record the composition of, of what was sitting at the surface when the glaciers crossed. And this is largely weathered upper continental crust. We see the rise of atmospheric oxygen, and we see a change in the composition of the upper crust um, between three or 2.9 and 2.5 billion years ago. And um, there's been a lot of, so I said, as I mentioned, we made these, um, these composites and made them available to the community, community. So there's been a lot of interest in them. These are some of the papers that have been published on those samples uh, to date. Um, it's basically, you know, if every element in the periodic table that has more than one isotope is now an isotope system, <laughs> a stable isotope system. And so there's lots of interest in analyzing them for those stable isotopes. And so here is some of the stuff that's not yet been published, but is ongoing work. Um, uh, again, all of these di different stable isotope systems uh, and some radiogenic systems. Okay, I will stop there and uh, take questions. And let me stop my sharing. There we go. Thanks, Roberta, that was great. We'll uh, give everybody a little bit to either type up their questions or raise their hand. Paul had mentioned earlier in the chat, just for everybody who's watching this uh, video, Paul Hoffman said, Roberta's interpretation that uh, CIA in many diamectites is derived from their source is supported by ple uh, Pleistocene tills in Antarctica, which have high CIA indexes derived weathered source rocks. So just for the for those who are watching and not seeing the chat. Um, okay, Thomas says his hand up. So Thomas. Yeah, I, I, I have some questions. That oh. was fantastic. I loved it. Um, mm -hmm. I was really struck by the weathering of the Archean. Something different is going on in weathering Archean rocks. And, uh, you know, my last several papers have pointed out Boy, they have a lot of sulfate in them. Um, I think Archean weathering was acid sulfate weathering. In other words, with the strong acid, with sulfuric, not carbonic acid weathering, which has ruled pretty much since that time. Um, what are your thoughts about that, about changing pH of weathering through time? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was about Thomas, I just realized it was <laughs> Greg <laughs> who's speaking. Well, oh, yeah. um, I'd be, I'm, I'm surprised to hear that Archean um, rocks have a lot of sulfate in them, given that it, they're pre-GOE. Are, are you sure it's Archean sulfate or is it younger? Oh, yeah. They're, well, they're, it's largely pseudomorphs, but many of the pseudomorphs have barite cores. There's a lot of barite in them, for example. Hmm. Uh, quite a bit of gypsum um, and also um, other salts, including the carbonate and alkalite um, and, well, quite a few others. They, they look like desert soils that form by acid sulfate weathering. Well, um, I would say 
for sure, we see this signature, this higher CIA, we see it not only in the diamictites, but we see it in shales. I think Kent Condy pointed this out years ago. Um, and so it seems like the weathering intensity might have been greater, but it's mostly, I mean, as far as our data are concerned, it seems to be completely anoxic weathering. And so I would be surprised to see sulfites. I don't, I, if you see sulfates, I, I don't know where they came from. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. It has to be anoxic. And, and the, the most likely culprits are um, sulfur oxidizing bacteria, which are anoxic. They're still around. I see. Uh, and we still find them in plies and in, in, in desert settings. Hmm. They, they, they do very well with low oxygen conditions, but they produce strong acid, not just this piddling carbonic. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay, well, that's an interesting idea that I hadn't considered. Yeah, there must be some correlate for strong acid versus weak acid in some of your um, trace element data, I would think. Um, the other thing that I've been noticing too is that there's a really strong light rare earth enrichment in paleosols of the Archean hmm. uh, versus marine uh, deposits. Uh, it's quite strong. It's more like a spodosol, a very acidic soil on earth today than hmm. um, an ordinary Perineutral soil. It's there's something going on there. That's interesting. So sulfate yeah. from sulfur re, sulfur oxidizing bacteria. Yes. So you've got a, a lot of sulfide coming out of basalts, which have a lot more sulfides than the granites, I would guess. Um, and then the bacteria are working on that to make uh, sulfates of various sorts under anoxic conditions. And a byproduct of that in any soil today uh, is sulfuric acid. I have several papers on this. I'll send some to you. Great. Thank you. Fantastic. I really enjoyed it. It's really stimulating. Oh, good. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Uh, okay, Thomas. Great. Thank you very much. Um, brilliant talk. Thank you very much, Roberta. Um, I read with great interest, um, particularly the 2014 and 2016 papers by um, Richard Gash, I think it was about a year ago. And I remember having these thoughts at the time and I'm desperately trying to put them back together in my, my head now. So I'll do my very best to get them out now. Um, so with your, your glacial diamictites, uh, and I, I appreciate you've used a very uh, broad definition. In general, the preservation potential I don't think it's very controversial to say, uh, of proglacial diamictites often formed from mass flow deposits is um, quite a bit better than those directly deposited by glacial action. Now, that needn't have much impact necessarily on your findings because both can be sourced from... One of the strengths of your approach, as pointed out by Goldschmidt, was uh, this ability of... Um, glacial erosion to take sediments from a great area, a real mix of lithologies. And you still get that benefit if the mass flow deposits proglacially are sourced from glacial sediments. Mm. However, you can equally um, have mass flow deposits purely slope failure because the tectonic processes occurring during glaciation are also yeah. the tectonic, you know, the rifting. For example, in the cryogenian, if we had a very sluggish hydrologic cycle and we thought although it's a little complicated, to have had very slow um, depositional rates, we would expect a relatively high proportion of your diamictites to be representative of mass flow, slope failure, tectonic deposits, mm -hmm. which hadn't necessarily been transported by ice at any point in their history, which, which removes the, um, that important element of your methodology. Now, I, I see that as a potential problem and a wonderful problem because I think it's a potential opportunity um, in, in two senses. Firstly, if this the glacial aspect of the study is potentially a red herring, is it not possible that these wonderful findings that you've been making could be extended to all diamictites, <laughs> if you like, um, all polymixed diamictites? I mean, is it... Have you considered putting a control into your experiment as it were, performing similar um, processes on 
diamectites, which are polymixed diamectites of a tectonic nature that you know not to have been deposited in the glacial environment. And swapping that around, if, and you probably are, uh, right, that the glacial aspect is important, could you use these uh, compositional tendencies as a discrimination tool between um, glacial transported and uh, slope failure deposits? Because answering that question has vexed geologists for generations, and it's a pain at the what's it. So, I mean, either way, I, I, I use the word problem, but I just see lots of opportunities for building on this great work. Do you have any thoughts on either of those? Well, th thanks for those comments. Um, so, as I mentioned, you know, we were relying on previous workers' designation as uh, these diamictites as glacial in origin, and but I don't believe all of them have the classic uh, requirements of, for example, striated uh, cobbles or, or drop stones and associated sedimentary rocks. So it's possible that some of them are not glacial, as you, as you mentioned. Um, whether we could, and, and it, but it, even at that, um, you know, we still see these, these trends. So whether we could use the chemistry of the diamictites to distinguish between, let's say, uh, slope failure deposits, um, just tectonic uh, diamictites versus glacial, I am, I'm not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> it's possible that we actually have some of those in our, and, and of course now we have Francis McDonald in our department and I've been learning a lot of, from him about glacial deposits and we would actually, I got to see some of the, our local ones in the Death Valley area. And uh, one of the things we're exploring with those which are clearly glacial, um, is how heterogeneous, how sorry, the, uh, the deposits are for a given formation. So for example, we have an, um, a senior thesis student who is looking at the detrital zircons in different seg segments of the same diamictite to see, are they gonna look all the same or, or are we gonna see heterogeneity within the detrital zircon population? Because, uh, and we don't know what the answer is gonna be, but um, so, so, you know, one of the one of the weaknesses, perhaps, in our approach is that um, relying on previous workers to say these are definitely glacial. Um, maybe they're not, but even if they're not, and we've got a mix of glacier and non-glacier, uh, we still see these trends. So it's that's to me that's interesting. If I could jump in here, I'd like to support uh, Roberta in this case. Uh, virtually all the diamictites that Roberta sampled were documented 50 to 100 years ago uh, with many illustrations of abundant uh, striated and faceted class. So you go, go back to those old papers um, by Coleman and, and, uh, and others, uh, you, you will see that the, the, the glacial origin was amply documented at that time. Uh, in addition to which many of these glacial deposits were, were formed on shelves. So there's no way that they represent uh, a toe of slope uh, debrites and any sedimentologist can distinguish a debrite from a glacial diamictite. Well, I think, thank you for that. And I think that's correct. The ones that I am uh, most concerned about, I guess, are some of the Archean samples. Um, I think, I think there's good evidence that Grant Young put together for the Mozan being glacial, um, but some of the other ones that we were sampling from the Vitz Basin and drill cores, um, I have no idea. I mean, Nick Bucus interpreted them as glacial, so that's what we were relying on. Um, and, and maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Um, in fact, Andre and, and, and I have been talking about the, the one that we call Deutschland, uh, based upon Nick's uh, definition. And that's such an unusual sample. and is it really glacial is, is a good question. One thing I would say, however, although it's true that uh, ice sheets sample large areas, they do so very unevenly. Mm -hmm. So if you look at uh, where the Laurentide ice sheet was, you can tell where most of the erosion took place because that's where the holes are, which are mm -hmm. now the deep lakes. And uh, those lakes are all around the periphery of the ice sheet. And uh, the reason for that is that uh, uh, glacial erosion scales with the um, uh, basal sliding velocity and sliding velocities are fastest at the equilibrium line, which is close to the edge of the ice sheet. The reason for that is that upstream from the equilibrium line, the ice is gaining mass and therefore accelerating and downstream from the equilibrium line, it's losing mass and therefore deaccelerating. 
So ice sheets uh, erode, but they erode very, uh, very um, uh, in a very biased way under the equilibrium line. And even there, they don't do so evenly because most of the erosion occurs in narrow ice streams that represent only about 10% of the periphery, uh, uh, narrow corridors of fast moving ice within the ice stream. And of course, those ice streams are what are responsible for the deep lakes, including the deep lakes around the periphery of the Swiss ice sheet, as well as uh, uh, North America. So, and then in addition, of course, the Mazan, which, uh, you know, uh, Grant Young and, and, uh, and other glacial specialists who visited do believe it is glacial. Uh, that, of course, was probably a small ice sheet, depending on how many other cratons were attached to Kupfal Craton at that time. Thank you. All right, Daryl, I think you had your hand up next. Yeah, I have my hand up. Uh, my question is, is about sort of, uh, I'd like to start with the Huronian. Uh, when you did your sampling in the, in the Huronian, did you concentrate just on, on the Galganda or did you look at differences between all three glaciations? Yeah. Were there so, differences? Yeah, so good question. Um, no, we, we sampled um, Ramsey Lake, Bruce and Galganda. And so something that's very interesting is that we know that the GOE occurred during that interval. And yet all of the deposits are showing evidence for anoxic weathering, even though some of them are clearly post GOE. And we think that that's just simply reflecting the fact that the glaciers were sampling crust that was weathered in the Archean um, and not, you know, um, it does not reflect the ox oxygen state at the time of deposition. So, but in contrast, if you see a, an oxic weathering signature in a sample, then you know that there must have been oxygen rise before the deposition. But the, an anoxic signature post GOE is just you know, because the, the glaciers were sampling crust that had weathered pre-GOE. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, uh, Lyle Nelson put in the chat, said thank you for the great talk. Given that there is evidence for chemical weathering in diametite samples, does redox sensitivity of copper relate to the higher concentrations of copper in the Archean? If so, how is that differentiated from changes in continental crust composition? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, um, you know, the whole basis of using copper is that we can reliably look back at its uh, at the provenance without having the influence of of the weathering in, impact the concentrations. And um, there have been studies of weathering copper and weathering profiles, and many of these show copper is relatively immobile, which would go along with its um, relatively short seawater residence time. It's classified on that diagram I showed as um, insoluble, uh, but it's sort of at the margin of being insoluble to moderately soluble. Um, there have also been studies of, uh, of chemical weathering that show that oxidative conditions cause sulfur, uh, sorry, carbon copper. <laughs> I'll get, the, I'll get the element here in a minute. Uh, copper depletions in the presence of oxygen and isotopic fractionation associated with that. And so, um, so, that, so that's a concern obviously, but the high copper concentrations in the Archean could not be explained uh, by that because we had no oxygen around at the time. Uh, even though they're strongly weathered, they were weathered without oxygen present. And so the copper should not be influenced by that. And therefore the copper, at least in the Archean sample should be quite reliable. I also think it's probably mostly reliable in the post-Archean samples as well. All right, um, Paul Link, were you trying to raise your hand? Um, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so, cause, okay. Right. Sometimes it's confusing. There's at the bottom of the link uh, sorry, the Zoom page, there's a reactions button. And if you click that along the top, there's a bunch of different, um, uh, a bunch of different emotions you can do. But at the bottom of that, there's a raise hand button. But Right. So uh, my question uh, deals with the, the recent idea that the snowball earth events eroded four uh, kilometers of continental crust uh, as, as demonstrated by the hafnium uh, isotope depletion. Uh, 
and uh, whether your studies are at all compatible with that, or if you have any comments on that. Uh, I am not familiar with that study, um, and I'm not sure why hafnium isotopes would tell you that, but uh, we, I don't think, I mean, from our data, we can't say what the level of erosion was, I, I think. And in fact, some of the, um, you know, some of our neoproterozoic samples could be quite uh, locally derived um, and maybe not, uh, uh, yeah. So I, I, I'm sorry, I just, <laughs> I'm not familiar with the, what the argument is and why half name isotopes would tell you the depth of erosion. Right. All right, and then there's Kent Condi. Uh, Roberta, that was a uh, great talk, fantastic. Thanks. Um, the question I have is, if you look at some of the early Archean areas that are exposed on the Earth today, such as in southwest Greenland and the Pilbara, uh, these would be the type of areas that these 2.9 billion year old uh, diamictites were sampling, basically. And if you look at those, there still is a high ratio of felsic component, the TTG component to the mafic component that's exposed today. So it would seem to me that you cannot be sampling those areas or areas like those in composition. What you're going to have to do is maybe have a more mafic component to the crust, which was being sampled by these early diamectites. Uh, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, our inference of a largely basalt dominated crust uh, is not what we see when we go to Archean cratons today. And so, um, you know, the only thing we can say is that, is that um, you know, what the glaciers were sampling is not what we're seeing largely um, in those Archean cratons. So, I mean, some of those granites are relatively young, so they might be. Um, you know, the transition that we're seeing is between around three and 2.5. It's very imprecise, but it's, you know, 500 million years of transition to from a much more mafic to a much more felsic crust. I think that the record sort of drops off pretty, pretty precipitously prior to 3 billion. Um, and so what we're seeing is, is that pre 3 billion year um, samples, I think with deposits that are 2.9. You know, it, 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 we recognized this when we were working with the sedimentary sections in South Africa on the Cotwell mm -hmm. Craton. Mm -hmm. And the, it seems to me it may be a, a level of erosion that we're dealing with that somehow the glacial deposits were seeing a more mafic component of the crust. But as you erode deeper, you start to see the intrusive components, and the intrusive components are largely TTG related. Mm -hmm. That's what we're seeing today, for instance, in the Pilbara and in the Ishua area in southwest yeah. Greenland. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. The basalt is lava, so it's easily eroded. Forty years ago, I said that the only difference between two billion year old tectonics and today is that there's more volcanism in a variety of environments. Today. All right. No, at the moment, we don't have two billion more. years ago. Mm -hmm. More, more two billion years ago than today, because the mantle was hotter. Yeah. So it easily, you know, it's easier to to reach the partial melt, you know, temperature of uh, mobilization. And a hotter mantle also leads to a more mafic, uh, it, you know. Like yeah, um, there's slightly it's higher magnesium number, but uh, you know, for the protozoa, it's still more mostly, but mostly basalt. I like mm -hmm. I like the copper story. Thanks. I do too. I want to follow up on it. Um, Roberto, just following on um, this uh, sort of pattern that uh, doesn't agree with predictions from Goldschmidt. So I'm wondering, I mean, one explanation with, with Glacier, you produce a lot of fine grain material that highly susceptible to um, to reaction with atmosphere. And I'm wondering if you would go across the glacier, glacial deposits and sample from the base uh, to the top, would you find uh, a stronger alteration signal, alteration with, uh, as a part of uh, 
reaction with atmosphere to a top of a glacier versus a yeah. place or if anyone uh, uh, are you talking like about the um the deposits themselves if you sampled yeah. across them yes well we yeah. did that um but like i said many of them are glacial marine so that so they got deposited underwater and then the cap carbonate for example deposited on top of them but we did several profiles through um deposits and we did not see any compositional change through those profiles. We looked at things like um, you know, the CIA, we looked at the strontium depletion, we looked at lithium isotopes, all of those sensitive to chemical weathering, and we did not see any changes, which is part of the reason we concluded that the weathering signature was an intrinsic signature that the glaciers were picking up as they moved across the continents. Thank you. Okay, with nobody else with hands up, um... The floor is open for the next little bit. If anybody wants to chat or anything, has an idea, go for it. And if uh, that's- Lyle, oh, Lyle just Lyle, asked, yeah. Pat, um, did you see a similar copper change in shale? And we haven't looked at them. And that's one of the things we're, we're talking about doing uh, collaboratively with uh, Andre and others is uh, maybe we can look at shales. Uh, Roberta, our condolences for the death of Ross Taylor. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you know, he lived a he could, lived a good long life, but he was, you know, I wrote uh, an obituary for him, and um, I was reviewing his his career. I was very impressed again of all the things that he did, and he was a great guy. Amen. All right. Okay. Looks like um, people are happy with with what you presented today, and uh, there was some good good discussion at the end. So thanks so much. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for showing up and asking good questions, and um, I look forward to continuing to explore all of these things and trying to get to the bottom of everything. <laughs> all right. Great. Well, until then, everybody, be safe until I see we see you again. See you all uh, soon, I'm sure. Apologies for my red light not functioning today. <laughs> <laughs> no worries.